So I want to welcome everyone for to, to, to Naro. This is our, our warehouse and this is our Christmas party of sorts. And we have a very special guest who I met in April of uh, 2004, so going back a good number of years. And the reason that I was in an office at the University of Toronto was to meet Richard Lee, who's a professor of anthropology, um, and we were talking about the Kalahari. So uh, Dr. Lee was there originally in the 60s and working in the area where I was uh, bound to travel to. So he gave me some advice, which was very instrumental in um, furthering my career, because at that time I was buying artifacts in the Kalahari Desert, but I wasn't in quite the right part to get the good stuff. So, so, so I was, I was advised. So, um, one of my favorite books is called the Dobe Kong. And at the end of it, there's a, a famous story, a tale of Christmas called eating Christmas in the Kalahari written by Richard Lee. So he's here tonight to, to read it for us. Um, after the reading, then we'll do a Q and a, if anyone has any questions for, 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 um, any of us. And then, and then, uh, we'll uh, enjoy the rest of our holiday. So I'll, I'll yield the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Richard Lee. <laughs> Well, this is a fun occasion. As Paul said, we've known each other for now coming on to 14 years. And um, he was originally a student of a dear friend and colleague named Matthias Gunther at Laurier. At Laurier. And so when Matthias said, oh, I'm sending over a, a former student who is uh, very interested in artifacts and arts and crafts from the Kalahari, uh, a recommendation from Matthias Gunther couldn't be uh, more uh, positive. And so we've had this uh, friendship now going back uh, a number of years. And um, <clears throat> when you had the store on the Danforth that for a while, and then uh, the regular uh, stops at the CNE, and then, um, but this is my first time here, and my wife Harriet and my son Luca are here as well, and so uh, we thought this was a fun idea to uh, have this have this reading, and so thank you, Paul, for thinking of it. I think it's uh, that's a good idea. So this uh, story, "Eating Christmas in the Kalahari," came out in uh, Natural History magazine in December of 1969, and um, it was uh, the magazine is the official magazine of the American Museum of Natural History, and at the time I was teaching and working in the U.S. Uh, at Rutgers University. And so, um, since I'm retired now, I was cleaning out my office recently and found the original uh, number from December of 69 with ads from that well-known uh, air, airline BOAC, the British Overseas Airline Corporation, which has been B British Airways for about 40 years. And, you know, wonderful uh, ads for uh, Kodak Instamatic uh, single lens reflex cameras. And so that was fun too. And um, so reacquainting myself with that uh, era. So the story that I'm going to read to you has had quite a career. It's been um, reprinted, I think, about 50 times. In um, It's a favorite uh, reading in books of anthropology for anthropology courses, where they say, what's a good essay to tell you, well, what's anthropology all about, and uh, what adventures do anthropologists have? And so it's had a, a nice career as a being reprinted. But I can say, um, uh, even though I used to read this as a bedtime story to my kids, uh, it's never, no one's ever asked me to, to read it in, in a public uh, space. So uh, here it is, Eating Christmas in the Kalahari by Richard Borshe Lee. The Kung Bushman's knowledge of Christmas is third hand. The London Missionary Society brought the holiday to the Southern Swana tribes in the early 19th century. Later, native catechists spread the idea far and wide among the Bantu speaking pastoralists, even in the remotest corners of the Kalahari Desert. The Bushman's idea of the Christmas story, stripped to its essentials, is 
praise the birth of the white man's god chief. What keeps their interest in the holiday high is the Swana Herrero custom of slaughtering an ox for his Bushman neighbors as an annual goodwill gesture. Since the 1930s, part of the Bushman's annual round of activities has included a December congregation at the cattle posts for trading, marriage brokering, and several days of trance dance feasting at which the local Swana headman is host. As a social anthropologist working with the Kung Bushmen, I found that the Christmas ox custom suited my purposes. I had come to the Kalahari to study the hunting and gathering subsistence economy of the Kung, and to accomplish this, it was essential not to provide them with food, share my own food, or interfere in any way with their food gathering activities. While liberal handouts of tobacco and medical supplies were appreciated, uh, they, they were scarcely adequate to erase the glaring disparity between the, in wealth between the anthropologist who maintained a two-month inventory of canned goods and the Bushman, who rarely had a day's supply of food on hand. My approach while paying off in terms of data left me open to frequent accusations of stinginess and hard-heartedness. By their lights, I was a miser. The Christmas ox was to be my way of saying thank you for the cooperation of the past year. And since it was to be our last Christmas in the field, I determined to slaughter the largest, meatiest ox that money could buy, ensuring that the feast and trans dance would be a success. Through December, I kept my eyes open at the wells as the cattle were brought down for watering. Several animals were offered, but none had quite the grossness that I had in mind. Then ten days before the holiday, a Herrero friend led an ox of astonishing size and mass into my camp. It was solid black, stood five feet high at the shoulder, and had a five-foot span of horns and must have weighed about 1,200 pounds on the hoof. Food consumption calculations are my specialty, and I quickly figured out that bones and viscera aside, there was enough meat, at least four pounds, for every man, woman, and child of the 150 Bushmen in the vicinity of Tai Tai that were expected at the feast. Having found the right animal at last, I paid the Herrero $20, $56 in those days, and asked him to keep the beast with his herd until Christmas Day. The next morning, word spread among the people that the big, solid black one was the ox chosen by Punta, my Bushman name. It means, my name means roughly whitey, white man, Punta, for the Christmas feast. That, that afternoon, I received my first delegation, Bain Na, an outspoken 60-year-old mother of five, came to the point slowly. Where were you planning to eat Christmas? she asked. Right here at Tai Tai, I replied. Alone or with others? I expect to invite all the people to eat Christmas with me. Eat what? I have purchased Yahave's black ox, and I'm going to slaughter it and cook it. That's what we were told at the well, but we refused to believe it until we heard it from you yourself. Well, it's the black one, I replied expansively, although wondering what was she driving at. Oh no, Bang uh, groaned, turning to her group. They were right, turning back to me. She asked, do you expect us to eat that bag of bones? <laughs> bag of bones? It's the biggest ox at Tai Tai. Big, yes, but old and thin. Everybody knows there's no meat on that old ox. What did you expect us to eat off it? The horns? <laughs> Everyone chuckled at Bain Na's one-liner as they walked away. But all I could manage was a weak grin. The evening, it was the turn of the young men. They came to sit at our evening fire. Gao Go, about my age, spoke to me man-to-man. Tunta. -man. 
you've always been square with us, he lied. What has happened to change your heart? That sack of guts and bones of Yahweh's will hardly feed one camp, let alone the bushmen around Tai Tai. And he proceeded to enumerate the seven camps of the Tai Tai vicinity, family by family. Perhaps you've forgotten. We are not few, but many. Or are you too blind to tell the difference between a proper cow and an old wreck? That ox is thin to the point of death. Look, you guys, I retorted, that's a beautiful animal, and I'm sure you will eat it with pleasure at Christmas. Of course we will eat it. It's food, but it won't fill us up to the point where we'll have enough strength to dance. We will eat and go home into bed with stomachs rumbling. That night, as we turned to, I asked my then-wife, Nancy, what did you think of the black ox? It looked enormous to me. Why? Well, about eight different people have told me I got gypped. That ox is nothing but bones. What's the angle, Nancy asked. Did they have a better one to sell? No, they just said that it was going to be a grim Christmas because there won't be enough meat to go around. Maybe I'll get an independent judge to look at the beast in the morning. Bright and early, Halangisi, a Tswana cattle owner, appeared at our camp. But before I could ask him to give me his opinion on the black ox, he gave me the eye signal that indicated a confidential chat. We left the camp and sat down. Gunta, I'm surprised at you. You've lived here for three years and still haven't learned anything about cattle. But what else can a person do but choose the biggest, strongest animal one could, could find? I retorted. Look, just because an animal is big doesn't mean that it has plenty of meat on it. That black one was a beauty when it was younger, but now it's thin to the point of death. Well, I already bought it. What can I do at this stage? Bought it already? Oh, I thought you were just considering it. Well, you'll have to kill and serve it. I suppose, but don't expect much of a dance to follow. My spirits dropped rapidly. I could believe that Bing Na and Gao Go might just be putting me on about the black ox, but Helen Gisi seemed to be an impartial critic. I went through the day feeling as though I had bought a lemon of a used car. In the afternoon, it was Kuma Zhou's turn. Kuma Zhou was a fine hunter, a top trance performer, and one of my most reliable informants. He approached me on the subject of the Christmas ox as part of my continuing Bushman education. My friend, the way it is with us Bushmen, he began, is that we love meat, and even more, we love fat. When we hunt, we always search for the fat ones, the ones dripping, dripping with layers of white fat, fat that turns into clear, thick oil in the cooking pot, fat that slides down your gullet, fills your stomach, and gives you roaring diarrhea. That was his. He, he was rhapsodizing on the subject. So, he continued, feeling as we do, it gives us pain to be served such a scrawny, thing as Yahavi's black ox. It is big, yes, and no doubt its giant bones will be good for soup. But fat is what we really crave, and so we will eat Christmas this year with a heavy heart. The prospect of a gloomy Christmas now had me worried. So I asked Kumisho, what could I do about it? He said, look for a fat one, a young one, a smaller but fat, fat enough to make us gum which is their word for diarrhea, then we will be happy. My suspicions were aroused when Tumajo said he just happened to ha know of a young, fat, barren cow that the owner was willing to sell. Was Tuma working on commission, I wondered? But I dispelled this unworthy thought when we approached the rare owner of the cow in question and found that he had decided not to sell. The scrawny wreck of a Christmas ox now became the talk of the Tai Tai waterhole, and it was the first news told to the outlying groups as they began to come in from the bush for the feast. 
but finally convinced me that real trouble might be brewing was a visit from Tungao, an old conservative Jintua man with a reputation for fierceness. His nickname meant spear and referred to an incident 30 years ago in which he had speared a man to death. He had an intense manner. Fixing me with his eyes, he said in quip tones, I have only just heard about the black ox, or I would have come sooner. Tunta, do you honestly think that you can serve meat like that to people and avoid a fight? He paused, letting the implications sink in. I don't mean fight you, Tunta. You're a white man. I mean fight between Bushmen. There are many fierce ones here, and with such a small quantity of meat to distribute, how can you give everyone a fair share? Somebody is sure to accuse another of taking too much or hogging all the choice pieces. Then you will see what happens when some go hungry while others eat. The possibility of at least a serious argument struck me as all too real. I had witnessed the tension that surrounds the distribution of meat from a kudu or Hemsbach kill and had documented many arguments that sprung up for a real or imagined slight in meat distribution. The owners of a kill may spend up to two hours arranging and rearranging piles of meat under the gaze of a circle of recipients before handing them out. I also knew that Christmas feasts at Tai Tai would be bringing together groups that had feuded in the past. Convinced now of the gravity of the situation, I went in earnest to search for a second cow, but all my inquiries failed to turn one up. The Christmas feast was evidently going to be a disaster. And the incessant complaints about the meagerness of the ox had already taken the fun out of it for me. Moreover, I was getting bored with the wisecracks, and after losing my temper a few times, I resolved to serve the beast anyway. If the meat fell short, the hell with it. In the Bushman idiom, I announced to all who would listen, I am a poor man and blind. If I have chosen one that is too old and too thin, we will eat it anyway and see if there's enough meat there to quiet the rumbling of our stomachs. On hearing this speech, Bang Na offered me a rare word of comfort. It's thin, she said philosophically, but the bones will make good soup. At dawn Christmas morning, instinct told me to turn the butchering and cooking to a friend and take off to spend Christmas alone in the bush. But curiosity kept me from retreating. I wanted to see just what a scrawny ox looked like on butchering. And if there was going to be a fight, I wanted to catch every word of it. Anthropologists are incurable that way. The great beast was driven up to our dancing ground, and a shot in the forehead dropped it in its tracks. Then, freshly cut branches were heaped around the fallen carcass to receive the meat. Ten men volunteered to help with the cutting. I asked Dao Go to make the breastbone cut. This cut, which begins the butchering process for most large game, offers easy access to removal of the viscera, but it also allows the hunter to spot check the amount of fat on the animal. A fat game animal carries a white layer up to an inch thick on the chest, while a thin one the knife will quickly cut to bone. All eyes fixed on his hand as Gao Go, dwarfed by the great carcass, knelt to the breast. The first cut opened a pool of solid white in the black skin. The second and third cut widened and deepened the creamy white. Still no bone. It was pure fat. It must have been two inches thick. A hey, Gao, I burst out. What? That ox is loaded with fat. What's this about the ox being too thin to bother eating? Are you out of your mind? Fat? Gao shot back. You call that fat? This wreck is thin, sick, dead. And he broke out laughing. So did everyone else. 
They rolled on the ground, paralyzed with laughter. Everyone laughed except me. I was thinking. I ran back to the tent and burst in just as Nancy was getting up. Hey, the black ox, it's fat as hell. They were kidding about it being too thin to eat. It was a joke or something. A put on, everyone's really delighted with it. Some joke, she replied. It was so funny that you were ready to pack up and leave Kaika. If it had been a joke, it had been an extraordinarily convincing one and tinged, I thought, with more than a touch of malice. Nevertheless, that it was a joke lifted my spirits considerably, and I returned to the butchering site where the shape of the ox was rapidly disappearing under the axes and knives of the butchers. The atmosphere had become festive. Grinning broadly, their arms covered with blood, well past the elbow, men packed chunks of meat into the big cast iron cooking pots, 50 pounds to the load, and muttered and chuckled all the while about the thinness and worthlessness of the animal and Clinton's poor judgment. We danced and ate that ox two days and two nights. We cooked and distributed 14 potfuls of meat, and no one went home hungry, and no fights broke out. But the joke stayed in my mind. I had a growing feeling that something important had happened in my relationship with the Bushman, and that the clue lay in the meaning of the joke. Several days later, when most of the people had dispersed back to the bush camps, I raised the question with Hakakoshi, a Tswana man who had grown up among the Kung, married a Kung girl, and who probably knew their culture better than any other non-Bushman. With us whites, I began, Christmas is supposed to be a day of friendship and love. What, what I can't figure out is why the Bushmen went to such lengths to criticize and belittle the ox that I had brought for, bought for the feast. The animal was perfectly good, and their jokes and wisecracks practically ruined the holiday for me. So, it really did bother you, said Hakakoshi. Well, that's the way they always talk. When I take my rifle and go hunting with them, if I miss, they laugh at me for the rest of the day. But even if I hit and bring one down, it's no better. To them, the kill is always too small or too old or too thin. And as we sit down on the kill site to cook and eat the liver, they keep grumbling. Even with their mouths full of meat, they say things like, oh, this is awful. What a worthless animal. What made us think that this swana rascal could hunt? Is that the way outsiders are treated, I asked? No, it's their custom. They talk that way to each other, too. Go and ask them. So Tao Go had been one of the most enthusiastic in making me feel bad about the merit of the Christmas ox. I sought him out first. Why did you tell me the black ox was worthless? when you could see that it was loaded with fat and meat. It is our way, he said, smiling. We always like to fool people about that. Say there is a bushman who has been hunting. He must not come home and announce like a braggart, I have killed a big one in the bush. He must first sit down in silence until I or someone else come up to his fire and say, What did you see today? He replies quietly. Ah, uh, I'm no good for hunting. I saw nothing at all. Maybe just a tiny little one. Then I smile to myself, Galgo continued, because I know he's killed something big. In the morning, we make up a party of four or five people to cut up and carry the meat back. When we arrive at the kill, we examine it and we cry out, You mean to say you've dragged us all the way out here in order to make us cart home your bio? pile of bones? Ooh, if I had known it was this thin, I wouldn't have come. Another one pipes up. People, to think I gave up a nice day in the shade for this. At home, we may be hungry, but at least we have nice cool water to drink. If the horns are big, someone says, did you think that somehow you were going to boil down the horns for soup? <laughs> to all this, you must respond in kind. 
I agree, you say. This one is not worth the effort. Let's just cook the liver for strength and leave the rest for the hyenas. It is not too late to hunt today, and even a diker or a steenbok would be better than this. Then you set to work, nevertheless, butcher the animal, carry the meat back to camp, and everyone eats. Dalgo concluded. Things were beginning to make sense. Next I went to Comejo. He corroborated Dalgo's story of the obligatory insults over a kill and added a few details of his own. But I asked, why insult a man after he's gone to all that trouble to track and kill an animal and when he's going to share his meat with you so that your children will have something to eat? Arrogance was his cryptic reply. Arrogance? Yes. When a young man kills much meat, he comes to think of himself as a chief or a big man. And he thinks of the rest of us as his servants or inferiors. We can't accept this. We refuse one who boasts, because someday his pride will make him kill someone. So we always speak of his meat as worthless. This way we cool his heart and make him gentle. But why didn't you tell me this before, I asked Comejo with some heat. Because you never asked me, said Comejo, echoing the refrain that has come to haunt every field anthropologist. The pieces were now falling into place. I had known for a long time that in situations of social conflict with the Bushmen, I held all the cards. I was the only source of tobacco in a thousand square miles, and I was not incapable of cutting off an individual for non-cooperation. Though my boycott never lasted more than a few days, it was an indication of my strength. People resented my presence at the waterhole, yet simultaneously dreaded my leaving. In short, I was a perfect target for the charge of arrogance and for the Bushman tactic of enforcing humility. I had been taught an object lesson by the Bushman. It had come from an unexpected corner uh, and had hurt me in a vulnerable area. For the big black ox was to be my one totally generous, unstinting axe of my year at Tai Tai. And I was quite unprepared for the reaction I received. As I read it, their message was this. There are no totally generous acts. All acts have an element of calculation. One black ox slaughtered at Christmas does not wipe out a year of careful manipulation of gifts uh, given to serve your own ends. After all, to kill an animal and share the meat with people is really no more than Bushmen do for each other every day with far less fanfare. In the end, I had to admire how the Bushmen had played out the farce, collectively straight-faced to the end. Curiously, the episode reminded me of the good soldier Schweik. Um, this was a novel uh, from uh, Central Europe of the early 20th century, the good soldier Schweik, and his marvelous encounters with authority. Like Schweik, the Bushmen had retained a thoroughgoing skepticism of good intentions. Was it this independence of spirit? I wondered that it kept them culturally viable in the face of generations of contact with more powerful societies, both black and white. The thought that the Bushmen were alive and well in the Kalahari was strangely comforting. Perhaps armed with that independence and with their superb knowledge of their environment, they might yet survive the future.
on to see if there's any questions of anyone. So I can thank um, Richard for directing me in that direction because I was then able to experience some of the adventures that you had uh, <laughs> later on. And then I, I had I was a young man, so I had some wild nights. And the thing I was watching out for, I would be warned if I was going out drinking with certain people that some of the people were fighters, so to be oh. careful and those sorts of things. But nonetheless, mm. we enjoyed ourselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so it's interesting, this story still gets reprinted in uh, anthologies of readings for uh, anthro courses and other courses. And so I'm happy to, to share it with you. And the floor is open if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Well, the, my main field work was done in the 60s. And then I was there for uh, first 15 months and then 21 months. And so that was a total of three years. And then in the 70s, 80s, 90s, I would come back every few years and spend a week or 10 days, sometimes uh, six weeks. And so um, I think my last trip, which was July of 2017, was my 20th trip wow. <laughs> to, the, to them, to the Kalahari. And I should say that this is set in Botswana, where Paul has done a lot of his work. And But in the last 20 years, I've been working in Namibia, which is just across the border, which is also something mm -hmm. you know well. Yeah, and I can say all the San people who I meet who know Dr. Lee speak highly of him, and they don't speak highly of every other person. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I learned the language, so sense of humor, which they're able to carry out in interesting, <laughs> collected ways. And so they'll love, uh, they love to banter mm -hmm. and, and joke with you. And um, in answer to the question, this paper was written in 1969, so that's almost 50, getting up to close to 50 years ago. And the question I uh, raised at the end, perhaps they might survive the future, and I can say, and you can back me up, they have survived. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a, an example, uh, the countries, Botswana and Namibia, have some of the highest HIV AIDS rates in the world, but the Jinkwasi uh, have rates that are something like 90% lower than the rates of the national, the national averages. And so that, to me, says, yes, they, they're exercising good judgment in a tough world. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? You had said that after the feast, we gathered around to do a transcend. Mm -hmm. what, what well, they, um, this is something that is sort of uh, unfortunately dying out, but for the first 20 or so years before the missionaries arrived, this was their main um, religious and health-related ceremony because it was healing dance. And certain um, adepts, men and women, would go into trance and then lay on hands in the, um, in the circle of uh, onlookers and singers. And uh, people swore by the efficacy of that, uh, of the trance healing, so much so that um, some members of the other ethnic groups would come and pay a goat or something, uh, or money, to uh, be healed by the Trinquasi. And so I didn't mention it, but my first article in Natural History magazine was entitled Trance Cure of the Cone Bushman, and I wrote my, my first publication actually was on the trance dance, and uh, now it's still in existence, but um, more or less you'd have to say missionaries have made inroads, and so there's more uh, people attending church on Sunday than there is dancing the old traditional dances. Yeah, so when I started the company, I was consulting. So for example, the name Naro is a, is a San name for people living in Botswana, and the first beadwork I bought was from Naro people. 
Um, <clears throat> so what I would do is go and consult with elders, and often that would involve going to places where people were still trans dancing. So that was uh, quite a treat for me. And um, one of my favorite times, there was an old woman who was a good friend of mine named Wakai Kong, but everyone called her Dada, and she was a painter. So she worked with Kuru in a place called Dakar, making paintings which were distributed by various people at that time, including myself. And so there were tricks that we had to do. So for example, if I would pay women in Dakar for their beadwork or anything else, I would try to pay them in a hidden way because if other San people saw that they had money, they would come and take it. <laughs> so there was some culture around that. So I would just listen to the instructions of the person who I was paying. And if it meant that I'd meet them behind the Jeep in half an hour and slip something to them, then that was no problem. So Dada asked me, she was getting ill by the, I knew her for a few years and at some point she was developing tuberculosis. So she had access to Western medical care and she was stable, but she felt that that wasn't what she needed. So she asked me if I could drive her some kilometers away from Dakar to a place called Eaton's Farm. And there was an old man there who was a powerful trance dancer. Mm. So I went and when I'd gone to other trance dances and they'd asked me to pay, it was quite a relatively high amount in Pula. But because Dada was the one who was commissioning the dance, it was something like 30 pula, which was $3 or something right. like that. So that was one of the experiences I got to see in the Kalahari that sort of shaped some of, you know, the way that your thinking changes yes. as you meet other cultures, my thinking did as well. And it's evolved into what we're doing now. So, I have a good, I have a story that follows up. Oh, especially Paul and Richie, you should explain what the dancing I, rabbits are. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to go over here. Yeah. <laughs> so these are called Jorosi. Uh, or Jorosi, and these are the dancing rattles. They're um, like cocoons and um, for caterpillars, and then the caterpillar is taken out, and it's dried out, it's slit, and then chips of uh, ostrich egg shell beads are put in. And so, uh, one time... You wrap it around your legs. You wrap it around your ankles. And so one time, Harriet and I are walking at the CNE, and we spot, we weren't sure, even, we didn't even realize at that point that he had a booth there. And so this would have been a while, quite a while ago. And so we look at this on the display and we go, Jerosi! <laughs> and one second later, Paul sticks his head <laughs> out of the booth. He said, who said that? <laughs> and so this is how we reconnected after uh, you by this point, you had done many trips. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would have been in 2007 or 8 yeah. at that stage. And but, um, your former research assistant, a gentleman named Roy Kutoko, who's now a deputy minister um, in the Namibian government, yeah. he came to Canada in 2005 because I thought as I was exploring working with people, it would be a good idea to bring community leaders from there to here to see how we're doing it. And one of the things that he took back amongst many souvenirs was a, a pair of Jerosi because he said they're hard to get <laughs> where he lives, and I had so many of them. <laughs> yes. I mean, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the Jerosi are sold to, to uh, buyers from the outside, and so when it comes time for a dance, they say, who's got Jerosi? And they have to go to the next village to find enough Jerosi for the dance. But it adds, it adds a lot. Uh, I have a feeling that if you went on, um, just punched in Bushman Dance uh, you would, on YouTube, you would probably get some pretty good examples. Yeah, and there's a popular band in Botswana called Culture Spears. So you hear them throughout the region, and their main source of percussion is Jerosi, which, which they call Matsua, because they would say it in Setswana. Our other Jerosi story that Harriet and I can share is we went to the Havana Jazz Festival about 20 years ago, and one of the uh, world music uh, gurus who came to perform was a guy from Brazil, and he had Jerosi on his bandstand, along with all kinds of other percussion. Mm -hmm. So we thought, oh, the Jerosi here, have come making, making it into world music. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so I, I think then I'll thank you for coming, and you're welcome to thank stay you. And, and look around. And, 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 and it's, 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 um, because I have copies of your book, it's one of my favorite Christmas stories, mm -hmm. but I thought it was appropriate to invite you so that we could share it mm -hmm. with, uh, with everyone else, and hopefully there's people watching online, and we'll post this on YouTube. 
so that the story can go even beyond the anthropology community. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, definitely see, look it up when we get uh, get home and see because you've live streamed it already. Is that it? Yeah, it's on Instagram here, and then we're recording for YouTube as well. How cool is that? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thanks. For okay. Well, thanks for me, thanks for coming down. I enjoyed <laughs> very much listening to your story. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, my God.